that's the first thing. And then the second thing I would like to ask you is um, if you have any, uh, any questions, uh, the easiest way to do it will be to ask the questions at the end of the presentation. And for that, uh, to make sure it's not going to be horribly noisy, um, I would like to ask you to put your question in the uh, chat box and then I will, I will help uh, Jörg at the end to answer uh, one question after another and to, to make sure that um, he answered to, to all the questions. So again, welcome Jörg and thank you uh, very much for giving this talk uh, together. And I hope everyone will enjoy uh, this presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks Charlie. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, very well. Okay, cool, okay, excellent. So, um, yeah, thanks, it's an honor to be asked uh, to do this. So, um, I have never done this, sitting in front of the computer, talking into onto a screen uh, without getting any kind of feedback from the audience. So, I apologize if it's kind of um, a little bit strange from a presentation point of view. But anywho, um, I'll try to make this um, interesting. So, um, uh, first of all, the university uh, and their lawyers wants me to make sure that um, whatever I say is my personal opinion, that no products uh, mentioned or whatever is getting endorsed. So if you want to um, contact me, here's my email. So uh, that much for the lawyers. All right. So basically, I uh, just want to provide a quick uh, overview of the literature. Um, what I kind of used, uh, the book that I have um, is that one. Um, I think it's out of print, but I just recently checked. You can order it online uh, from Amazon as a Kindle version, so you have it on your files, um, which is about $70. If you try to get it as a paperback, it's a, a lot of times it's uh, significantly more expensive. This is a nice little book. It's, uh, I guess, a little bit dated now from 2006, but still um, I find this um, uh, a nice book. And like I said, I kind of use that a little bit to guide um, that lecture. Uh, in general, I assume that the vast majority of you are going to be seeing dogs and cats and then some exotics on the side. So maybe your clinic doesn't want to invest heavily into just exotic only. There's these books, uh, one of them that I found, um, and uh, disclaimer, I don't have that book. I just uh, looked at it um, and I wanted to introduce it here uh, in case you don't know it. Um, this is a fairly big book, which obviously covers dogs and cats uh, and exotics, too. Um, it does have about 60 pages on exotics uh, in the back. Here's a copy of um, the index. Um, to me, the interesting thing uh, about that chapter is that the way it's organized, I feel um, that you already have to have a really good idea what you're dealing with because obviously these uh, problems are listed by the diagnosis already. So if you have no idea and you need to work your way through it, I don't know, to be honest, how helpful that is. But anyway, it's, it is a good read. Um, one thing that I like about this book, and this is taken from this book, is um, uh, it includes algorithms. And, and I really do feel and think that this is the way um, in the future to learn. Um, it helps a lot of people um, to, um, to think logically. I think whenever we deal with any kind of problems, thinking an algorithm is a good way to go about. Um, and it's becoming more and more popular in human medicine as well. So it's not just that we are on the veterinary island are doing something um, against the mainstream. So this is definitely becoming more and more mainstream. And I kind of like that idea. So I will potentially use that um, to guide us a little bit through the lecture here and see what uh, uh, what kind of topics we got to think about it. So again, uh, if we start with a patient and we want to kind of think a little bit in an algorithmic way. So we have our first little checkbox. We have an appointment that comes in. So, and usually what I want is that um, at least here at the university students, and I think it's a good idea for everyone, uh, no matter how long you've been doing it, um, to just brush up a little bit on um, your basic knowledge of dermatology, just because it's a ferret, a rabbit, or a frilled lizard, doesn't mean that your basic dermatology knowledge goes out the window. So just uh, obviously remain calm. And what I'm going to use, what I'm trying with this talk is I'm just going to use the rabbit as an example 
Um, but basically, if you're thinking through logically, you can tackle any kind of exotic animal with certain considerations. And those considerations I, hi I try to highlight a little bit. So, um, okay, so uh, before the animal actually uh, walks or hops or slithers or flies into your office, you probably should have a good idea about um, the anatomical and physiological considerations. So just read up on that and make sure that you cover all these bases. So, and again, we're using the rabbit a little bit because maybe you're seeing a rabbit that looks like this or the owner is really concerned asking you questions. Well, um, this would be compatible with normal because they usually mold twice a year. They start from the head, as you can see in that picture, the head is already beautiful the, the ears are beautiful and as we go further caudal over the body it looks a little bit more raggedy so this would be actually compatible with absolutely normal shedding pattern if you have a little brush um, you can do this or this would be a potential reason if the other bunny um, over grooms and ingests a lot of hair that they present maybe for a wool block or something like this um, special features, the feet, and we're going to talk about this. So again, they don't really have a foot pad on the back, uh, have on the back legs. They, um, they, they have these hair. They have basically one of these comb over situation that protects them, um, because they're having these plantigrades, uh, stand and the metatarsis therefore is pretty vulnerable. So every time that you pick up a little bunny, uh, flip them over quickly, take a look at this, um, uh, and one of the predispositions is definitely the rex because the rex doesn't have this long guard hair so the rex can do their little comb over over the metatarsis and so especially an obese overweight rex would be uh, probably a little bit more prone to pododermatitis than the other bunnies uh, when we talk abscesses, uh, again, it's really uh, important to remember that their pus is very different than um, the pus that you're dealing with, uh, the dog and cat situation. So, um, and this is because they lack an enzyme, the myeloperoxidase, which basically digests the white blood cells. Um, and that's what makes the pus kind of like liquidy. Um, for these guys, the pus has a little bit more like a consistency of green cheese. So, Therefore, as a routine, you can actually approach these abscess situations kind of like you should be treating them like a tumor or pseudo tumor and really cut them out. Um, physically, you have to remove it. Do yourself and the owner and the rabbit and everyone do themselves a favor. Don't place these drains and hope that uh, that uh, opening, putting a drain it will actually be helpful. I think it works exactly the other way around. Environmental bacteria, whatever, just use the drain to migrate up in there. So um, that is usually a very frustrating exercise. So bacterial diseases starting with these guys talking about abscesses. So um, again, a lot of times we have a breach of the uh, of the outer barrier, um, or we have a bacteremia. So. Uh, Facial abscesses from dental problems were really common, and you know one can wonder why this is so frequent. Uh, it's maybe because I'm chewing, chewing, chewing. Bacteria get into the gingiva micro lesions or something like this, and then they migrate down and cause these dental abscesses. So um, again, keep looking. There is probably something going on, and we need to correct that. Um, uh, in some cases, um, it's, a, it's a different form of an abscess. Uh, it manifests as a cellulitis-like. It's, it's usually staph or pastorella, um, and um, that is really nasty. And it's extremely common, like in that uh, educational handout here, where it actually says it has a rodent-like smell to it. So I think uh, uh, it's pretty common out there. So and this is how in the human medicine they learn about these guys. When it smells like a rodent, that's maybe pastorella. So the clinical signs um, is that in comparison to uh, uh, to an abscess, is that skin is very, very uh, painful. So while usually they could have an abscess the size of a golf ball or baseball or whatever, it's your favorite sport, um, they you can squeeze it, you can poke it, you can, and they usually don't mind that much. Um, however, with um, the cellulitis, they're extremely, extremely painful. Um, and so that's one of these uh, differences. Um, in addition, they can be febrile and obviously that absolute non-specific clinical sign of anorexia. So 
Um, this is kind of what it looks, what it can look a little bit like, and hopefully the picture does it justice. Um, so basically, you see the skin underneath there is, is kind of a, a little bit thickened. Um, it's maybe tough to uh, tough to see from the picture. You just have to pay, take my word for it. So that's why um, it is a little bit different. They really don't want to be touched. Um, uh, and when you mock around with it, uh, it becomes very obvious that they're super sensitive. Um, in addition to this, um, because it's not being nicely walled off like just typical abscesses, you definitely want to put them on systemic antibiotics. Um, so sometimes these scars will fall off, uh, especially after treatment. Um, it, it can be difficult to put topical treatment on their chest because they're so painful and it becomes all stressful and we definitely don't want to send these guys into gastric stasis and handling them a couple of times and putting like an ointment on a, on a very um, um, uh, hurt, uh, painful lesion. So um, if you decide to clean and debride, that should be done under full anesthesia. So uh, again, um, just because of the pain and um, I'll have a picture come up later where you actually see uh, how the skin just literally falls off. So um, again, a lot of times uh, when you have these um, this, uh, problems come in, I hinted a little bit to it, you need to potentially then review the husband. You need to ask, well, why is this abscess or why is that situation there in the first place? Just treating it is maybe a little bit fire engine medicine um, because you can be successful in treating them, but if you're not removing the cause of the problem, um, they're going to be back a couple months later and it's going to be a frustrating exercise. So ask good questions. So here's an example, for example, these uh, moist dermatitis you sometimes see with these uh, with these overweight females that have uh, an inflamed dewlap or lesion in the dewlap, uh, as you see in that kind of picture there. So one of the common situations that um, could be contributing to the problem is that they're drinking out of a water dish um, and basically that do lab um, is never really going to dry up nicely. And so you have that skin fold that is moist, that is warm, it's dark. Well, that's a beautiful um, incubation chamber right there. So again, if you just clean and clip that and you're not addressing the situation of this rabbit being a little bit um, overweight and maybe asking these questions about how does the rabbit drink or stuff like this, you're going to uh, fight a monster. Um, then, of course, uh, check for dental disease is that coming something from actually uh, a molar or something like this and it, um, this is where the real problem is so um, and again a lot of times you will culture pseudomonas out of there talking about these uh, drinkers um, because there's a really cool paper out there um, so um, which basically looked at the drinking behavior and because you could say, well, I can easily avoid this with just uh, putting these animals on these zipper bottles. But study from uh, in Switzerland has actually been done where they looked at it. And if you see at the water consumption, which is the blue bars versus the nipple drink and red, you can actually see that um, these rabbits significantly prefer uh, to drink out of an open dish. So yes, in general, I still recommend that open dish based on that paper. And it's just a much normal behavior. Um, but if you have a situation like this, it means that you may have to offer uh, that bunny a little zipper bottle and make sure that this animal is maybe not getting subclinically dehydrated um, if you do a switch. But in general, uh, I do prefer those open dish uh, bottle uh, uh, dishes over over the zipper bottle. Uh, here's a here's a picture of that kind of like moist dermatitis progressing, maybe the cellulitis there is really nasty as you can see. And I hope the um, picture gives it a little bit justice that maybe with a little bit squinting of your eyes and imagination, you can see that this is sometimes a little bit blue greenish. You obviously see the, the hay stuck onto that. It has a very distinct smell uh, to it. So a lot of times uh, remember how in the human book they refer to it as rodent like smell. That's the pseudo owners. So again, as you see in that picture, that bunny is actually completely anesthetized, getting supplemental oxygen and maybe a little bit sevo gas um, on the schnoz. Uh, because as you see, the skin is just basically opening up there. There is this nasty pus uh, sitting there and that really needs to be um, aggressively taken care of. And yes, that is a painful situation. As mentioned before, these kind of things should be on systemic antibiotics. Talking about ectoparasites, fleas, uh, they have their own little flea. And again, um, 
that's maybe be a little bit of academic exercise to try to identify this, but you can based on the head anatomy. Um, so you can look that up and see how that differentiates from cat flea. But in my experience, the vast, um, the, the most common uh, scenarios that they actually present with the cat flea. Um, that is kind of like important, obviously, um, to know um, from that point of view. And if you see a lot of cats, you're probably very familiar with what a cat really looks like. So again, clinical science, there's nothing specific about the rabbit. Um, so you can either see the direct feces, or sometimes you can actually see the flea walking around. Um, with the feces, there are obviously these brown specks or dirt specks. Uh, so if you just put a little bit of a, of a moist toilet paper on there and collect them, and you see how they suddenly, those brown specks turn actually red and the paper on the paper test and that will be the digested blood from the from the uh, flea so uh, for the treatment um, this is why it's important that you actually and start asking well how many cats do you have uh, what is the situation because if you just focus on that rabbit alone this will be again um, uh, it's a practice builder because they're going to come back constantly and want more but it's going to be frustrating after a while because the vast majority do get the fleas from the cats so just make sure you're asking these questions and and script out enough antiparasitic to treat all the cats uh, again most people know this by now that you shouldn't be using fipronil in rabbits um, I guess um, um, there have been some fatalities reported. Uh, so just if you if you do have um, any other options, please use those. If you for some reason have to use the fipronil, I guess uh, one can use it. But the thought is that um, please don't block these um, bunnies that use the fipronil immediately on a cage back because maybe it is actually those fumes that kill them. So, um, but it's best to avoid them. So again, which leads us to the next kind of idea. Sometimes we just need to know what kind of drugs are potentially toxic. And, and that is something that we just have to memorize or we have to use a good formulary. So if you see these guys, just make sure you have a good formulary at hand that you potentially know which drugs are cool and which ones are contraindicated. Uh, for those of us who deal with bunnies that live outside in hutches, that's sometimes uh, very common in the summertime, in the fly season, and it's a heartbreaking disease uh, because up front they look totally fine and num 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 eat the hay and chew on it, and uh, in the back it seems like um, out of a living dead uh, movie scene there. Um, and if it's severe enough, a lot of times euthanasia is the treatment of choice if they've potentially perforated the body wall and you can see them crawling in and out of the body cavity. So that is very frustrating. So um, sometimes um, that fly strike can be primary. This would be the green bottle fly, the Lucelia cuprina, for example, or it can be just secondary. So again, I think um, asking good husbandry questions is important because if they're on a hutch, a lot of times it is maybe a little bit related to uh, not the perfect sanitation. They haven't cleaned that hutch in a while or underneath the hutch. And if you have enough feces, the fly world will hear about it and they will just hang out there and then you will ask them for this problem. So, um, and it would be a routine thing to just turn, tell these people like when they feed their bunny on a daily basis in the evening, maybe they want to turn the bunny over and check for these fly situation just to um, not have any secondary problems so yep that's a bad case as you see right there so clipped and cleaned um, a lot of times you can see the eggs because they're very very minute and especially with the dense fur so you only see those little tiny maggots after they hatch even then they're very small so and it is a lot of times a problem diagnosing this very very early on might be mild or it might be severe and like i said because clinically that bunny acts like totally normal up front and in the back it looks like a disaster so that's heartbreaking so again uh, it's easy one to obviously diagnose um because you see stuff walking around and eating the bunny alive um treatment how do we treat these ones um uh, basically um again supportive care they could go into shock um so keep that in mind um that is a really nasty open wound uh, and these guys potentially wreak big hyrax so clean that um and then maybe you want to dilute a little bit of the avamectin 
Um, most of the other Mactrin solutions, obviously, in, um, they're not water soluble, so you might have to put a little bit of a soap uh, in that water, or you can um, dilute it in a little bit like glycerin. Um, but again, soapy water works well, so uh, you can give it orally injected, but then also wash maybe the affected area to get a high topical concentration right there. And then obviously, because this is kind of like a big wound, like a burn wound, so you may want to consider systemic antibiotics on that. Um, you can put obviously something topical on there, like silverdine that is antifungal, antibacterial, um, and again, just treat it kind of like a burn wound, I would say, because there's a huge risk for secondary problem. Uh, could a rebra larvae, um, a lot of times we consider them opportunistic uh, infections. Uh, we'll see them every year. We see one, at least one case, especially if you see wildlife, you can see those. Um, and um, again, the, the, you see this little swelling. Um, and this is why it's really important doing this routine physical exam and someone that really palpate um, these bunnies through or these this small mammals, uh, palpate them through nicely with your finger, run all over, because um, between the dense fur, that could be overseen, but you hopefully would feel like a little nodule, um, um, but uh, easily to miss. So, um, and, uh, in this picture here, you see actually that little breathing hole that that install larva has. Uh, it's stuck deep inside, and um, and in the next movie, you can actually see it move, um, and it's pretty creepy. Uh, and you see that little head go uh, in and forth. So you know this is a, a live little larva there. And um, that needs to be removed physically. So this is not going to come out um, just by luring it out. So these little guys can be fairly small, or they can be really big. As you see, this is unfortunately an animal, a little baby bunny that was euthanized. You see the nostrils, the mandible, and it had actually three of those in the neck, um, which was basically a similar um, uh, circumference than the head itself. So, and uh, I have no idea how that bunny was still alive. Uh, poor thing. So they come in all different kind of shapes and sizes. So when you're trying to remove those, you got to be a little bit careful um, that you don't want to just um, go in there with forceps um, and yank those guys out. Um, there have been reports that once these little maggots or insta larvae are actually ruptured, that they could cause an anaphylaxis. Uh, so my favorite method is actually obviously sedate the bunny a little bit because that would be stressful um, consciously, a uh, heavy sedation. And then I inject a little bit of lidocaine right into that breathing hole. Um, serves obviously two purposes. It hopefully numbs the skin around there, but it also completely anesthetizes that little um, Cuda Rebra uh, larva, uh, which makes the removal much easier because they do have these little hairs that stand out and basically work against um, uh, them being removed. So a lot of times you have to cut open the skin with some scissors and just uh, make that hole a little bit bigger, open it up and carefully pull them out um, again. Um, don't try to rip them out. They will break, um, and then you have a problem. So I usually just leave it then open, um, and let it heal in by secondary granulation. Again, that's the same thing. Maybe we want to review a little bit husbandry and see that, uh, um, the situation is kind of sanitary. A little bit more about environmental diseases. I briefly mentioned that uh, ulcerative protodermatitis in the beginning, and here you see a baby bunny or a normal bunny. I can see the chest just right there flipped on the back, and you see that um, uh, with the plenty grandstand. And then, so with every physical exam, you kind of want to evaluate. Uh, that situation in the rexus, as I said, are very prone to uh, that because they can do, they don't have these guard hairs um, that they uh, literally, uh, like I mentioned before, it's a comb over, it's like a cushion. Uh, and so they're very prone, especially when they're uh, obese. So uh, as we said here, so um, again, this comes in where anatomical physiological knowledge makes a little bit sense. And then again, um, if you have a bunny that just comes in for routine check, but you see it's obese, um, just definitely make sure um, you, know, you check this area. 
uh, again, uh, even if it does, it's not obese, check this because if it is a little bit reddened and irritated, maybe um, we need to ask them about husbandry. Do they live just uh, on a tiled floor, on a hardwood floor? Do they have like uh, maybe a carpeted area or something like this where they can relax? And that sometimes helps to prevent this. And um, prevention is definitely uh, the key word here because once it's going really bad and sometimes it doesn't look that bad uh, from from, uh, from outside, from a clinical, but as you see, that joint is significantly swollen there. Maybe there was a puncture wound, um, and they don't have to be super sensitive there, uh, but um, there is a little crust, uh, it's not swelling. You may want to take a radiograph. If you see osteomyelitis, the prognosis is unfortunately already pretty um, bad, because once you have this infection in the bone, um, you're definitely behind the curve here. So again, preventative medicine is the key word. So, uh, this unfortunately is a bunny that needed to get um, legs amputated because of the severe osteomyelitis, and that's not what we want to uh, wait for. So again, preventative preventative measures are important. So keep an eye on the way. Tell the owner to maybe weigh that bunny on a regular basis, right? Even if it's only one a month. And if they see an increased trend, they need to pump the brakes on the little alfalfa trees. Floor that can be obviously addressed with um, old t-shirts, old bedding material, stuff like this. So again, um, if it is early, debride, clean, um, whatever goes, everybody has their own little secret recipes. So, um, but uh, make sure it's not getting worse. Again, bilateral cause here, and as you see, um, looks nasty. <laughs> Um, that reminds me uh, to just, uh, again, if you're not that familiar with these bunny ones, make sure that you are not freaking out when you see this little white uh, lesion right there because um, the bunny uh, fibrous tissue is kind of looks like this. So um, try with a Q-tip. Um, if it doesn't have that pus-like consistency, it's probably that white fibrous tissue that they lay down. So don't go in there, bananas, and rip it out with the forceps. Um, that's part of the healing process. So this could be a little bit confusing. Moving on, more bacterial stuff, rabbit syphilis. So again, Triponema paraluis cuniculi, it used to be called Triponema cuniculi, so it just changed it, uh, but it is a spirochete. And um, they can get infected at birth or obviously in direct contact. Um, so, and it can stay um, in hiding for a long time. Usually in the books, you can read that they have about an incubation time of one to two months. Um, and the important thing is that you're stressing out because when you use the word syphilis in the exam room, a lot of people have a, a Pupillary dilatation, make sure that we're not dealing with the human form of this that everybody understands because you don't want to jump, have them jump to conclusion and potentially surrendering the money. So uh, again, clinical signs, um, I apologize, this is not super in focus, but I think it was low light or I assumed that a little bit too much. Um, so when you have these kind of crushed, reddish, crusty lesions around the nose, uh, maybe even between the digits or in the anal genital area, alarm bells should go off. Um, there's not a lot of diseases that kind of look like this, where you have these beautiful crusty lesions formed with uh, without massive kind of pus coming out of the nostril. So, again, that's kind of um, interesting presentation. And like I said, it could be asymptomatic because maybe they got infected at birth um, and never showed it. So, again, there's another case. Crusty. So um, I find the best way to really, if you want to diagnose it accurately, is take a little biopsy. Um, take a little piece of a biopsy, submit it, normal histopath, and just make sure that you're mentioning this in the submission form that you have a suspicion that it could be a treponema um, because um, if the pathologists read this, they will actually then start uh, with their normal H and E stains, and if they don't see anything obvious, just because they they read your comment that you're suspicious of a spirochete, they will probably slap a silver stain on there or another special stain after the H and E, um, because um, these spirochetes are known uh, not to be. Um, the best bacteria to be seen with routine staining. So this is, again, the more information you can provide um, the other diagnostic services, the better your outcome is. Um, the serology is available. It's the same as the human test, so it can be used. Uh, so uh, if you have a lab that does that, so go ahead and take some blood. Um, and then um, treatment, it can actually go away on its own. Um, 
But uh, the treatment of choice is penicillin G. Again, it's important to know. Yes, while we don't want to give it orally, obviously, as an injectable form, it's a fantastic drug to cure those diseases. So, um, again, you have to maybe educate the owners about this, not to um, have their bunny ever lick a little bit of that, just do beautiful subcutaneous injections, or if they're nervous, just have them come in your clinic and you do this as a tech appointment or something like that. Moving on to fungal diseases. Um, uh, microsporum could be seen. Um, again, the, the reason why I have this in green is it just reminds me that the yeah, microsporum can fluoresce under the wood's lamp. So while this is very impressive to do this in front of an owner, it makes you look really cool. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that if it doesn't fluoresce, it's not. So it's kind of like a little bit of a, like, okay, if it fluoresces under the wood's lamp, you, you have a really good idea. That's what you're dealing with. But if it doesn't fluoresce, it doesn't mean it's not. And I think the last time I checked, it's, it's close to be 50, 50, um, 60, 40% fluoresces, something like that. So you can flip a coin. Um, trichophyton, um, uh, is, uh, here, normal color, which means that does not, uh, fluoresce. And they all obviously look, uh, very similar. So you see kind of like I always like to compare it to like a forest fire burning through the woods. Uh, you'll see some ashes there and the active part is still uh, considering. So they obviously can be asymptomatic carrier. They're getting stressed. So this truly is a zoonotic potential. So you might want to educate the owner um, and say, hey, you know, if you're itchy or something or you have lesions, go to your MD and just let them know that we recently diagnosed uh, a fungal uh, pathogen on your body. Um, uh, lesions can be literally everywhere. A lot of times they start in the face because I think that's probably where we pay most attention to it, but they can obviously be everywhere. So um, this um, this is a really representative nice picture that I have here of a case. So there's not a lot of other um, um, causes that uh, that leave that kind of like, uh, like what I call a forest fire-like uh, appearance behind. So treatment, again, you want to not just like treat the bunny, you want to make sure that you get the spores and everything out of the environment. So that means that if they're living in some kind of wooden hutch, um, maybe the best thing is to literally burn that hutch or something like this, because those spores can live for a long time in organic uh, surfaces. If it's plastic, you know, you need to clean it thoroughly. And as you see with this uh, bunny, so even though the active lesions is right there, you want to really... Um, just like, again, the firefighters do, they cut, they chop down the trees, so to take the nutrients away. So you want to um, shave it significantly better to put then your local ointment probably on the end. You want to attack it systemically as well. So I find uh, Griseofolvin has worked for me in the past, um, and I think that is actually, if I remember right, that is actually one of the few ones that we can actually use in case um, the uh, doe or the uh, female is pregnant. Most of the other uh, fungicides have a significant teratogenic effect. So, um, and I like Rishifo when I have some good experience with that. Viral diseases, if we have people uh, here from Europe, they probably know significantly way more than um, than I do because we don't have it that much here in the United States. So again, uh, myxoma, uh, leporipox, and basically um, while it doesn't um, directly kill the rabbit, or what it causes, it causes this myxedeme in, mainly in the head, and those rabbits in the wild actually die, as you see here, probably of starvation um, because they can't really prehend food anymore, and they can't see the big bad wolf coming because the eyes are closed shut. So this is basically how these poor guys die. Um, in Europe, there are um, vaccines available. The FDA has not approved them here in the United States last time I checked. So, um, but maybe if it becomes an emerging disease, uh, it will change. Um, so again, it literally means the big head of the swelling. So we have to kind of like try to prevent it. If we don't have a vaccine, we have to keep these bunnies indoors during mosquito season in those endemic areas. So um, in the U.S., last time I checked, uh, it's mainly restricted to our east coast, or uh, our west coast, uh, California, Oregon. Uh, and like I said, in in um, in Europe, it's it's everywhere. And um, you can actually, no matter where you live, you can find uh, you know online resources where it has been reported. This is from the House Rabbit Society, and as you see, uh, 2017, 18, um, we have a couple of reports here. Uh, so far, I don't think uh, we have any 
confirmed reports on the other side of the Rockies. Uh, if you go online, we, um, it's being monitored in England, and this is a map from Germany. So um, it is around, so you just need to know if you live in an endemic area. But again, in Europe, there's nice vaccines for it. So again, um, stay up to date um, with your emerging diseases and new trends. Um, there's always a few of them. So um, continue reading those journals and books and go to these conferences because you hear about them there first. Ectoparasites more. The one of the big ones that we obviously uh, have to talk about is Pseuropteus cuniculi. Um, and it presents, it can present with these very severe lesions. Um, and it always, it always makes me uh, ask the question, well, why are you coming in today? Because yesterday that wasn't fine, clearly, uh, but whatever. Um, important to realize that maybe that picture does it a little bit justice. You see this kind of reddish discoloration that it causes a very, very severe, intense irritation of the ear canal um, because these mites do really uh, dig into that uh, into that um, skin, and I think um, the body just reacts to it with inflammatory lesions, and it, it's really nasty. So um, uh, it's a direct transmission. So again, we need to disinfect the environment as well. And um, so maybe in the beginning, um, the report was the head shaking, maybe period of severe. So this is when you want to catch it, not when that uh, when a big nasty crust is there and it maybe develops into otitis media. So again, this is when endoscope helps looking into those bunnies here with the otoscope that you hopefully have anyway. Um, and so this could be even a little bit normal serum and this is that false ear canal that they have and then you go down and mm, you know, maybe you see that pus and stuff in there. And so again, you want to catch these clinical signs early on when maybe there's just a little bit head shaking, pruritus, hyperemia before there's this massive crust. So if you just uh, put a little bit of that stuff uh, with a Q-tip on a microscope, you see these very easy to diagnose. Uh, a lot of times they are live walking around and basically any of the avamectins that you have on your shelf will do. So anyhow that you give it to this animal, give it obviously orally again you can make a little bit soapy suspension with it and put it um you can have that acorex you can put that in the ear so the really important thing that i really want to stress here is you have to fight that urge um resist that urge to really try to make that bunny look beautiful with these nasty lesions um this is really really painful so i know the owner probably expects because they came to you that um, you're going to give them a beautiful looking bunny back home with but um just explain it to them it would be literally removing these crusts would be probably the equivalent of, of, of skinning um, that rabbit alive. They will, you will hear them scream, you will hear them uh, struggle and fight. So just, just educate these owners, resist that urge to make it look beautiful. Start with your abamectin treatment and in about a 10 days, those things will fall off completely. Uh, the walking dandruff mite, the Chylotiella parasitovorax, again, this is completely different because um, it just sits on the surface, it's eating um, and chewing, and you see a little bit dandruff walking around while the mite is walking, and this is why it has caused um, or gotten its name, walking dandruff. Um, important of this is that it's a zoonotic disease, so um, again, you may want to point that out um, to seek advice from the MD in case uh, you see or you diagnose Chylotiella. So again, it helps a lot um, to know what actually has a zoonotic potential. Obviously, you do want to protect you and your staff and provide service to the owner. Uh, this is what it looks like. It looks very different uh, uh, than the Psoroptus cuniculi that we saw before. Um, but again, the clinical signs are very different uh, because these guys live so superficially. You can take a little scotch tape, the clear scotch tape, just take a couple of these uh, dandruffy lesions under the microscope and you should see that it's pretty straightforward. So again, they're susceptible to the abamectins as usual. So talking about this, this is an interesting paper. So this came out in 2008 uh, where they treated these rabbits. And uh, when you look at the numbers, actually, um, they weren't 100%. Rabbits were in remission. So they got 80%, 50%. So it makes you think that hmm, maybe that is uh, already getting a little bit resistant or what's going on. Why didn't they get 100%? Um, 
Um, I think maybe they got 100% because they didn't use at a really, really high dose. So there's a uh, paper published by Dr. Carpenter recently, um, that was 2012, where they actually used 20 milligram per kilogram. But also, instead of once a month, you have to use it every seven days, okay? So it seems that these bunnies metabolize these abomectins like crazy. Um, so that is maybe a little bit of, and this is why this other paper was um, not 100% successful in the treatment. So it seems like in rabbits, the abomectins are really safe to use, even at these high doses. Um, and still be careful, I would say, because this is information that came out of that paper, which I thought was interesting. Um, a, you know, they obviously were guided by a ruminant dose, which is toxic toxicity dose is four mix per kick. Uh, equine is two mix per kick. So, um, but interesting, there is studies out there where they looked at pregnant rabbits again, and if they have, uh, if they have reused the dose at six mix per kick, six mix per kick, it resulted in toxicity. So um, again, we, we should always uh, keep these uh, uh, toxicity studies in mind. Um, and just to show you um, as an example of interspecies variation, so if we take that same kind of thing, 15 mix per kick and, and um, switch out the species to a pet guinea pig, you see that actually a single uh, injection of ivermectin uh, or a celamectin, a single dose repeated injection of ivermectin at 400 uh, micrograms per kilogram actually lasted for 30 to 40 days. So again, the bunny, you want to use a 20 mix per kick every seven days and a guinea pig that one monthly treatment is actually fine. So that's, I thought, very interesting. So again, um, that is kind of like important to realize that that's another reason why you want to attend the CE meetings. Congratulations, that's what you're doing right now. So you're already ahead of the curve. But go to your meetings and do this, um, read the literature because, uh, I find it really interesting that, uh, stuff like this, um, which, um, is not obvious is sometimes presented and surprising there. Uh, Self-mutilation barbering is not super common in rabbits. This was a case that I saw uh, was an eclectic rabbit, um, and as you see, doesn't fit that uh, pattern of potentially ectoparasite because it looks like a feather plucking parrot um, everywhere where that little bunny um, uh, cannot reach with the teeth. The bunny looks fine, and the rest is just groomed off. So, could be uh, could be a barbered by the dominant animal. But if that was the case, I would expect that the whiskers would be gone, and obviously um, barbering around the head too. So, um, can occur with uh, with estrus uh, or in a low fiber diet. And I think that that low fiber diet was potentially that case because we put that bunny on a nice high diet and without any kind of treatment, it grew in back uh, for nicely. So maybe that was a neglect or abuse case, but it was one of those found cases. So we didn't know much about history. Um, in other animals, especially in uh, lab rodents, it has been um, documented that if deep injections um, uh, have maybe been placed too close to the sciatic nerve or any nerve, and then you have a little neuritis and then those animals pay really close attention to that and start to chew, chew, chew. So again, when you do those injections for um, uh, pre-medication, induction, anesthesia, make sure you are um, be aware of that, that you're not injecting something too close to a big nerve like the sciatic nerve or something like this. And again, ask questions about the underlying cause. So again, this was another bunny that completely mutilated the belly off and um, all these gaps would come up regularly. We tried everything and eventually we came to the conclusion that Prozac is the drug of choice, was an obsessive compulsive chewer probably, um, but with high doses of Prozac, that guy did actually pretty well. So uh, for a chewing, for a blocking, again, is that normal? Is that abnormal? We already have that picture with that abscess there. And this is another picture of a bunny, and you see actually there's uh, there's fur missing right there, but otherwise the bunny looks pretty good. And this would be a physiological uh, cause of uh, alopecia there, because the female plucks out a little bit of hair for the nest. So if you do have a female and she's starting to pluck this, and yet you don't have a male, um, you may want to look into the hormonal imbalances. Could that have a ovarian remnant? Could the bunny potentially have a pseudo pregnancy? All of those things. So that leads me to the next point that we should also be a little bit familiar with obviously the species specific normal behavior in order to uh, uh, say when this is abnormal because uh, that last bunny was a good example of nesting behavior.
Uh, talking quickly about neoplasia, we're coming to the end. Um, so cutaneous lymphoma, I think, is the most common skin cancer that we see. So uh, it can manifest in very different things as lymphoma likes to do. Usually when the skin is kind of like thickened, you see it up there, like this elephantiasis-like presentation. Um, but um, in comparison to that cellulitis that we uh, talked before, that is usually not very painful or sensitive skin. So it's just like, again, I like to diagnose these things by biopsies because then you actually know what you're up against. Um, as with any um, lymphoma, it responds well to radiation, but my experience is that there is probably some other lymphoma somewhere else, and I would start systemic aggressive chemotherapy because that's my experience that there's some other lymphoma sitting somewhere as well. Uh, so this is that same bunny after a few days after radiation, so you see how much that shrank down significantly. So that was before. Again, this is that, that thickened skin, uh, but it's, uh, like I said, pain-free. Uh, sebaceous adenitis, just a few words on it. So there's case reports of successful treatment as one of those odd uh, odd presentations um, where, again, I think the diagnosis is always made by histopaths. So this is why I'm a big fan of that. Uh, uh, you are all members of the AMV. Congratulations. That's why you're getting this journal. That's why you're here, hopefully. So um, uh, this is one of those diseases that uh, I don't think we fully understand. Um, more and more kind of different kind of presentation and different kind of uh, therapies are being discussed. And again, sometimes they only make it to proceedings to so go to the conference because just because it's uh, not in the printed journals, it doesn't mean that it's not out there. Somebody thought of a cool treatment. So uh, basically, again, um, with these sebaceous adenitis, we just sometimes have to be uh, familiar with species specific diseases. We can't really explain them, but we just need to know that species gets that disease, full stop, memorize it. So again, that's kind of like the end. As you see, I wanted to use the rabbit a little bit as a, as a um, representation of just how to work up a dermatologic case and what have to think about. And um, as you probably all agree that if you see these guys, you're doing a whole bunch of dermatology work on a regular basis. Um, so it is an important topic and hopefully that was kind of a little bit useful to you. So moving on, I think, why is this not letting me? Okay, can we please move on? There we go. So final conclusion, um, again, working up a skin problem, systemic order, like you, uh, systematic order, like you probably already doing for dogs and cats. Um, you've got to know a little bit about that specific species, about what they're most likely to get or what you're probably not going to see. Um, but if you think, um, you know, in a in an organized fashion, uh, you will do you'll do really well. So that's the last slide. So thank you guys very much for hanging in. And um, are there any questions, Charlie? So thank you very much, Jörg, for your presentation. Uh, dermatology is such a, a frequent um, in topic in, in consultation. I think that was really helpful for for everyone. And yes, we already have many questions. So I'm going to go back to the beginning of the chat box. And the first question is what uh, is the proper technique for using honey in treating abscesses? Uh, okay, so that's a cool question. Um, so the proper technique. So let me just first uh, um, say there is now actually a couple uh, commercially available honey products out there. So actually honey soap gauze and bandages that you can buy. Um, and, um, so, um, they are, um, they are kind of nice because for some reason they have some kind of like, I don't know, matrix mesh or whatever that actually makes the honey really stick to that bandage nicely. So it's a little bit more in a solid state, um, uh, but they do, um, charge appropriately for it. So what you can do is, um, the most important thing is that you go to a store, if you buy your own honey, um, the medical grade honey is the Manuka honey. Uh, which is mainly coming out of New Zealand. Um, and it's supposed to be the best one for them. Again, uh, there's a premium, a significant premium price for it. I have treated a few abscesses with just regular honey, local honey. And I must say that I was very pleased with that. So I don't know if I would um, say that uh, the the significant uh, premium price for Manuka money is, is that much worth it. But I don't know if there's anybody did actually comparative studies on it. The important thing is when you purchase the honey or when you get honey, that it's raw honey, meaning it shouldn't be pasteurized. It shouldn't be actually um, significantly processed. Um, so uh, because with that pasteurization, 
pasteurization process, you will destroy a lot of those uh, factors that are considered uh, antibacterial, antifungal, and so on. So, um, uh, if you're using your normal honey, um, um, you can obviously put it in the, you debride the wound as usual, you make a normal kind of like, like you would potentially prepare a wound for wet to dry bandage, and your wet part is then basically a layer of honey. Um, if you're using the just normal sandwich kind of honey, the raw honey, a lot of times you will see it will create a little mess. Uh, just the body heat of that um, of the animal will make the uh, honey very runny liquid. So you put on a, you have to put on good bandages, and then you change them every day, every other day. And this is that significantly benefit of I think it's called Madey honey um, that you can order already gauze impregnated. And I find that that is absolutely worth the money because that sticks around so much better. Thank you for answering. So we have a second question. How are you physically collecting your biopsies, punch biopsy, and which size do you use? Um, yeah, good question. So basically, um, I'm a little bit wimpy when it comes to scissors myself and needles stuck into my body. So I usually uh, do, do that same service to my animals. So I want to I wanna go get away with the smallest kind of like... Um, uh, option from a biopsy point of view that is feasible. So yes, punch biopsies I like to do a lot. I, you know, if you get a two millimeter punch biopsy, the most important thing when you get these smaller biopsies is that you're trying to get them from real representative samples. So let's use that uh, fungal lesion as an example. Like you heard me, I like to compare it to the forest fire, right? So um, if you just biopsy that from the center lesion, um, and um, you might be getting a false negative because the pathologist can say, yeah, there was significant irritation, inflammation, maybe infection, but the fungal element has already moved on because there's no nutrients anymore for it to eat. So this is why you have to get it from that active lesion, from, from where you see the erythematous. Sometimes the skin is a little bit oozy. So um, that's why moving then a little bit up, having four millimeters or eight millimeter um, is, is important, uh, increases your likelihood of catching one of these pathogens that are not super packed in the lesion. Uh, and then just make sure you're getting full thickness wise that you're going through to all to the way to the muscle. Um, and um, um, sometimes um, if it is kind of like in the conjunctiva, a biopsy there with Trevony or something like this, I just lift it up and use like a uh, tiny ophthalmology forceps or something like that instead of obviously the, uh, the biopsy punch. So. Thank you. Um, we also have another question. Have you used uh, Ralaner in rabbits for psoriasis test clinically? And what do you no, think about it? No, I have it? not used. No, sorry, I can I can answer that quickly. No, I have not used this. Um, so that would be really interesting. Uh, um, I, I I don't know that much about the product because I haven't been I want to say been backed into a corner where I would have needed to use that. I'm very happy with uh, my my go-to medication is uh, Revolution Celamectin. Um, I have had good success with it, and most of the time, also from a practical point of view, the uh, most time the puppy the puppy little tube just fits for most of the rabbits. If you do the math, it comes down to about you know 18 to 25 milligram per kilogram when you squirt the puppy dose on. So um, I personally have no uh, experience with them, sorry. Um, and I think that, no, there is, there is another question with um, some, so that's a long one. So it's um, someone who is uh, sharing story. some experience. Uh, so for a case yeah, of dermatitis, uh, so in UK, as uh, they are using a product called Pseudocream, uh, and uh, they have quite good result with that. And uh, at the end, there is also a question. Do you use any cream specifically, or do you only focus on uh, softer uh, flooring and weight and activity levels? 
Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, um, I used to be a real big fan of the silver Dean for most of these thermals, but until we did actually a little study in comparison, uh, healing, uh, that was a different study using, uh, looking at the uh, different methods, uh, using laser powers. And so we also used uh, silver Dean and that was a reptile. That was the iguana study. And actually to my shocking surprise was that the, the wound that we treated, um, and that wound was created with this dermal skin uh, with a biopsy punch in order to create a standardized wound. Uh, I was kind of a little bit shocked about the outcome uh, as histologically the lesions, these open lesions that had silver Dean on them actually healed um, the least amount at the end of the study. So now I'm a little bit sensitive and putting uh, silver Dean on these open lesions may be very superficial. I do it. Um, I'm a big fan of the laser for wound healing. Uh, I think we, we can see improvement on that it also has energetic properties and all that stuff so i see a lot of benefits for the use of laser uh, and then yeah definitely husbandry um uh there is some other hydro gels and uh and silver silver based gel so uh, that's kind of like the nice thing about uh dermatology and and the skin and wound healing um we don't have that one beautiful, you know, this is the right way method. There is uh, as many different products out there as you can think of, and everybody has their own little secret thing. So whatever works for you, it's, it's one of those things I'm always willing to try out a new product uh, if I come across it. Um, yeah, we just heard uh, Charlie read that comment about a new product being out. I've never heard about this one, but um if, if you're not happy with wound healing, um, I would say obviously go out and try absolutely something different. Uh, I I don't like the, the, the honey for these plant areas. So to, to sit in the honey, I think that has a potential to make a big mess. Um, so, but I think clean husbandry uh, for these lesions um, where the weight is constantly on it, that's a, that's a, that's a, a tricky problem to solve. And especially when we talk about guinea pigs, right? Guinea pigs with photodermatitis are a nightmare um, because uh, just the way their body is shaped, most of the guinea pigs are tend to be a little bit obese in captivity and we can't just take uh, the weight of that easily on them. So, um, and that's, I think a couple of um, presentation at conferences have actually highlighted the beneficial effect of multimodal approach, including uh, laser as well. So. And so one last question, uh, because then we're going to end this webinar. Uh, do you use Convenia uh, as an antibiotic uh, in, in rabbits for skin disease? No. Yeah, no, I don't use Convenia. And um, I think uh, one of the reasons why Convenia is not super popular is that uh, I've heard somewhere, I need to find that out somewhere, that actually the half-life for convenia in rabbits is extremely short. Um, so, which um, obviously takes away all that beautiful convenient um, advantage of convenia. So, convenia is one of those drugs that you've got to be really careful in which species uh, you use it because some of the um, papers have been presented at Zoom meetings where they used it in marine mammals and it has a half life of, of significantly longer, like months or something. Like this. The worst is my understanding is that in rabbits it really doesn't have a significant long half life. So, um, no, I haven't used it. And again, I haven't found myself uh, trying to use it. If I go to an injectable antibiotic or anything, a lot of times I'm really going back to that pen G. I find that it's an amazing antibiotic. Uh, works for a lot of uh, our problems just because it's obviously not one of those antibiotics that is hopelessly overused um, as with other antibiotics and rabbits. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jörg, uh, for this great presentation again. And thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, first AMP webinar. So this is something we're going to repeat in the future. I hope you enjoyed uh, it, and I hope to see you uh, soon in the next webinar. Um, so everyone, I hope that you will have a, a, good, uh, a good day, and uh, see you soon uh, online for the next webinar. Thank you very much, and uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks.